Welcome to Too Late Who Gives a Shit, the show in which I talk about something that's already been thoroughly reviewed, debated, that every possible opinion has been expressed over and that no one wants to hear anything about ever again. Making this video a really dumb fucking idea. Let your fan base die. Kill it if you have to. But I think it's fair for me to talk about the film when every corner of the internet is still oozing hatred for it. Watch a video of kittens playing and someone is shitting on The Last Jedi beneath it. The prequels had a notoriously bad reception, but this almost seems worse. Or at least more confusing, because this time critics mostly loved the movie. With the final chapter of the story looming, I wanted to entangle myself in this clusterfuck of a thing by offering a breakdown of why I think the film is good. But first, by watching this video, you certify that you are a mature adult capable of considering opinions contradictory to your own without taking severe offense and organizing harassment campaigns and other retaliatory actions. This video is merely one fan's opinion presented for entertainment purposes and is intended for individuals with a sense of humor. If you do not have one, then you are encouraged to watch something else. Now, with that out of the way, we can talk about how Star Wars fans are the very worst people. Just the dumbest- Oh, shut up. You stay! Fuck you! All that fans kept saying after the prequels was how much they wanted movies like the originals again. I'm not sure they understood what that meant. Because those films were made under completely different circumstances. When Star Wars was silly. Didn't think it was gonna be any good. Whereas I didn't. Leia's your sister. I said, oh, come on. Her hair and weird buns on the side. I said, this is the goofiest thing I've ever read. You gotta read this. I passed it all around because nobody cared. You know, we have large dogs flying spaceships. You know, you describe it and people say, oh dear. The Wookiee has no pants. Lucas originally wanted to do Flash Gordon and couldn't get the rights to it, so he cobbled together ideas from westerns and samurai films to make his own space adventure. What he made me think of is the uh, Japanese sword master. <laughs> It was so unoriginal that it doubled back on itself and became original again. No one knew what Star Wars was when it released. Audiences had never seen a movie like it. They had to be shown what it was by Lucas and the subsequent filmmakers. But it turned out to be a story they already knew. Lucas heavily based the plot on classic mythology, especially Joseph Campbell's writings on the hero's journey. Star Wars isn't science fiction. It's an adventure that's thousands of years old and universal to every culture. I attribute most of the success to the psychological underpinnings, which have been around for thousands of years, and the people still react the same way. Lucas took that mythology and told it on the biggest scale it had ever been told on before, which is the ultimate achievement of Star Wars. A generation was forever changed by these movies. To the people that grew up with Star Wars, it's not just a movie they like. It is their childhood. Star Wars is no longer silly. It's sacred. And this is where the fun begins. Because now, everyone in the theater thinks they know what Star Wars is better than the filmmaker. And who could tell them they're wrong? These directors are just fans like anyone else. Everyone was impacted by the movies differently and so everyone has their line in the sand. Their vision for what the characters should be and any new story is inevitably going to alienate one part of the fanbase or the other. Especially since the fan image of the originals has gotten so disordered that The Last Jedi ended up being heavily criticized for doing the very things those movies did. In fact, I would take it a step further and say that if The Empire Strikes Back had somehow only been released today to this fan base, they would probably tear it apart. Uh, visual aberrations fan were never fiction. established in the prior oh, canon. You now can't he's just choking make him through the TV. Up. Oh, he's now Skype he's choking him through the TV. Him. Okay. Oh, hello. Yeah. Pressurized okay. space suit. Walk out it's the negative 100 degrees on an asteroid. On. Is stupid. there a cozy atmosphere so in a space stupid. rock? Fan you can only survive in space for 10 seconds. I Google it. What is a creature like this even eating? How does this massive creature flying out to the remote asteroid? Field. I am your father. Oh, they ruined God. my childhood. What a massive wreck. They ruined it. They ruined Luke's wow. character and Vader's character. Where's the Vader's time? backstory. Fuck you, Irvin wow. Pershner. Still with me? I can feel your anger. If you're not convinced, here are some examples, beginning with... The Force began as a vague metaphor for religion and kept changing form right up until the cameras began rolling. If you list every ability seen in A New Hope, they don't exactly make the most sense together. The Empire Strikes Back expanded those abilities, with Luke outright using telekinesis, gaining superhuman agility, and seeing through time. By the end of Return of the Jedi, the Emperor is shooting lightning out of his hands. It's fair to say that this was being made up as they went along. And that doesn't diminish the Force in any way. It was an incredibly flexible plot device, something to move the story and characters along that could take whatever form the writers needed. This is a good illustration of how the Force was used. It doesn't matter that Luke can jump 20 feet in the air. That ability is never important to the story. But knowing how literally fans take things, I assume there's a 20-page Wikipedia article about Jedi leg ligaments. The ability only has meaning in the context of Luke's character arc. He wanted to go off on an adventure and join his friends in fighting the Empire. He realized that goal and became the leader of the Rebellion, and believed that becoming a Jedi would make him an even more powerful warrior. I'm looking for a great warrior. 
Force not make one great. <laughs> he barely knew anything about the Force and fundamentally misunderstood what being a Jedi was about. Adventure. <laughs> a Jedi craves not these things. No weapons. You will not need them. He struggled through a series of failures and was just beginning to make progress when he sensed his friends were in trouble. He arrogantly believed that he was powerful enough to handle the traps set for him and left against Yoda's warnings. And in the ensuing fight, we see that Luke is powerful, performing superhuman feats of strength. Even Vader is impressed with his abilities. Most impressive. But as the fight goes on, Luke realizes that he's completely outmatched. The Force is much bigger than he knew, and his abilities amounted to nothing. This moment was just a stepping stone on the way to this moment. No! And they could have demonstrated Luke's power any number of ways. Jumping seems like it was just an arbitrary match for the layout of the freezing chamber. If the room had been different, maybe Luke could have used super speed instead. The literal form the Force took didn't matter. It was always working in the service of the story and the characters. But after years of worshipping these movies, fans demand that it work the other way around. The Force is super important, and your story and characters had better work in the service of it. And that means locking everything to only what was seen in the originals with no more room for imagination or growth. That's not how the Force works. The 900-year-old puppet can come back as a blue ghost, but shooting a lightning bolt is blasphemy. When Obi-Wan said, If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. I'd like to think he meant he could do a little more than just hang around and shoot the shit. It was clear that he was holding back his full potential. If you choose to face Vader, you will do it alone. I cannot interfere. So why is a lightning bolt out of the question? Just because we haven't seen it before? People hated Leia pulling herself through zero gravity, which isn't even a new ability, just an old one in a new context. And yes, you can survive in space for a minute or two, I googled it. It's an awfully weird time to suddenly start caring about realism, isn't it? Luke's projection is right in line with how the Force was used in the originals. His greatest achievement wasn't blowing up the Death Star. It was resisting the dark side and refusing to fight. That was the moment when he became a Jedi. I am a Jedi. Like my father before me. His scene on Krayt is that same idea on a larger scale, with Luke using everything he learned about the Force to resolve the situation peacefully. The people saying he genuinely should have been there, taking down Adat Walkers like a badass or missing the point. Maybe what those people wanted to see was this. Destructive power is a Sith thing. We always heard the Jedi prizing non-violence. A Jedi uses the Force for knowledge and defense. Never for attack. But they were basically soldiers and assassins in the prequels. Send me to kill the Emperor. Luke using knowledge instead of violence to win the fight is the most Jedi thing in the series, but it ignited a controversy because it's not in the rulebook. Ryan Johnson made the mistake of posting an excerpt that referenced the ability and haters immediately descended on him because it wasn't canon. You fucking moron. I hate to break it to anyone, but one fictional book of fake space facts isn't any more or less real than another fictional book of fake space facts. There was never any real definition of canon. Things shifted in and out of it all the time and the sheer volume of extraneous books and games led to a convoluted coding system to determine canonicity by ranking. The only person whose opinion should matter on this is the creator of the series, and George Lucas didn't care for much of anything other than the films and the Clone Wars show. Uh, the Emperor doesn't get cloned, Luke doesn't get married, and Jar Jar's the best Star Wars character. Well, That's canon. No. No. Alright, you George, son of a George. bitch. Stop it. Go to the dark Get him off me. Disney established a committee to ensure that every new storyline is totally canon, and that includes The Last Jedi. So yes, everything in the film is totally canon. And if you take issue with that, why is this bureaucratic system any less legitimate than what came before? If you need a committee to rubber stamp your fantasy adventure plot points for your consumption, maybe you're the one who doesn't understand what the Force is about. Think about it. Fans hated the midichlorians because it made the Force into something small and knowable. If you've condensed the Force into a book that could be sold by Kenner, haven't you done the same thing? Here's another thing you can't do anymore. Pretend for a second that you're seeing Darth Vader for the very first time. What is he? Is he even human? We find out that he used to be a Jedi before turning evil. Okay, how did he get in the suit? Oh, I cut his arms and legs off and left him to die in a river of lava. Not mentioning that would have been strange. We find out in the next film that he's Luke's father, which tells us more about Luke than it does about Vader. We already knew that he was a good Jedi at one point. He's still such a mystery at the end of the trilogy that just seeing his face felt like a giant revelation. 
We didn't really need details on Vader for the story that was being told, and the mystery of what happened to him was a major component of his character. It inspired people to continue wondering about him long after the films were over. When the prequels explicitly showed how he turned, a lot of people were disappointed that it didn't live up to their imaginations. And that's a lesson that Star Wars fans can't seem to learn. Because after decades of getting books, comics, video games, and I assume Pez dispensers with plot points etched into the Pez, it's taken for granted that we'll get to know every last detail. It's great that fans love this universe so much, but the fixation on literal detail suffocates the larger mythology that Star Wars is a vehicle for. For example, when Snoke appeared in The Force Awakens without a backstory, fans rioted and caused $15 million in damages at the premiere. What about the Emperor? He's even more powerful than Vader. He looks like he's a thousand years old, he wiped out the Jedi and turned a democracy into a fascist empire. There's obviously a story to tell there, and yet we learn nothing about where he came from in the film. The Emperor is important within the Star Wars universe, but to us as an audience, his main importance is that he's the wedge between Luke and Vader. Luke is the angel on Vader's shoulder, Palpatine is the devil. To have him regale us with the details of how he came to power would just be a distraction from the scene that we were there to see. Snoke has even less of a need for a backstory since he's an offshoot of that character, a wannabe emperor trying to assume the same role. We've seen enough people get disfigured in their pursuit of power that JJ must have figured we were smart enough to figure this out without having to see it again. Like the Emperor, Snoke is only important to us as an extension of another character, Kylo Ren. Kylo's story seems to be one of the Force balancing itself. The Jedi didn't really understand how it worked and thought that balance meant killing all the bad guys. Is he not to destroy the Sith and bring balance to the Force? So the prophecy says. A prophecy that misread could have been. But a lot of quotes from Lucas imply it to be more of a literal balance, requiring both sides to some extent. This movie makes that clearer than ever. The ancient Jedi even kept some sort of dark side crystal beneath their island for that purpose. Balance. Powerful light, powerful darkness. The Jedi recruited a massive number of light users which allowed a super powerful Sith to pull Anakin to the dark side and destroy them. As the last Jedi died out, the Force began to flow through Luke and he pulled Anakin back to the light, leading to the Sith being destroyed. Or not. I'm leaving Palpatine out of this until we know what the fuck is going on. Luke began training a new generation of Jedi, and with Snoke apparently being the only counterbalance, Ben was pulled to the dark side to even things out. He destroyed the Jedi which led to Luke abandoning the Force, leaving no active Jedi on the light side. This led to Kylo being pulled back to the light. I feel it again. The pull to the light. His resistance to this led to the light finding an outlet through Rey. I warned my young apprentice that as he grew stronger, his equal in the light would rise. That constant back and forth has defined Kylo Ren's character. I'm being torn apart. He's like a desperate cultist looking for an escape, and Snoke has convinced him that the answer is going fully to the dark side and becoming the next Darth Vader. Kylo does everything Snoke tells him and it doesn't work. He becomes even more conflicted and less powerful. Bested by a girl who had never held a lightsaber, you failed! After some reflection, he realizes that he's being used. He has the chance to kill his mother and doesn't take it. When Rey calls him a monster, he agrees. Yes, I am. He needs to free himself from Snoke in order for his character to move forward, and he needs Rey's help to do it. Because every time you get two Sith together, the apprentice is always trying to recruit another apprentice to join with him to kill the master. A lot of people interpreted this as a subversion of their expectations, which has become a meme now. But if you're paying attention to the character, it's not a subversion. This should be the expectation. He's not turning good. He's doing exactly what his character needs to, and he's offering Rey the chance to come along, just as Vader did to Luke. And fans also hated this because they didn't get their fucking Wikipedia page filled out. You can't kill him yet! I need him! The film is already overlong and packed with plot. How would this have helped? I will kill you with the crudest stroke. But first, let me tell you about the summers I spent on Nylar 7. Growing up, I always had a fascination with antique clocks. The ticking. Oh, the talking. Cynthia was the first to break my heart. <laughs> I tore hers out of her body! You've never had Robopie until you've had Keldabe Robopie. Not yet, child. We haven't even gotten to my quinceanera yet. Ray spent the previous film obsessed with finding answers to who she is. For my family. They'll be back. And doesn't find any when she arrives at Luke's Island. The important thing for her character at this point isn't the answer, it's breaking her dependence on it. 
It's your greatest weakness. Looking for them everywhere, in Han Solo, now in Skywalker. In her desperation, she even turns to the dark side. You went straight to the dark. It offered something you needed. Let me see them. You didn't even try to stop yourself. She's forced to accept that there isn't an easy answer that will solve everything, and that she has to determine who she is completely by herself. Kylo Ren is in a similar position. They've both been failed by the light and dark sides of the Force and had to find a new path forward, and in that way have an unexpected bond. If they can resolve their differences, this could finally lead to real balance in the Force. People like to say that Ryan Johnson threw away everything J.J. Abrams set up, but just because you didn't get the answer you wanted doesn't mean that he didn't use those elements. Instead of going for fan service and making her Obi-Wan's granddaughter, he took the threads from The Force Awakens and used them to challenge the characters as much as possible and tell a far more interesting story. And the one challenged most of all was... Before even getting into Luke's character, Ryan Johnson did not decide to make him a broken hermit. Neither did J.J. Abrams. George Lucas did. His story treatments apparently had Luke hermited away at the original Jedi Temple, with a female student seeking him out and forcing him to overcome his depression. Boy, that sounds an awful lot like The Last Jedi. Lucas even approved concept art for the setting during the transition to Disney. It's often argued that Luke never should have ended up in this position because he was always hopeful and upbeat, but that's only one side of his character. Just isn't fair. Oh, Biggs is right. I'm never gonna get out of here. If there's a bright center to the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. Where are you going? Looks like I'm going nowhere. Can't believe he's gone. Oh, two, what are we doing here? No, oh, I don't even know what I'm doing here. We're wasting our time. The boy has no patience. We'll never get it out now. Always with you, it cannot be done. I can't. You want the impossible. I can't do it, R2. You can't go on alone. I'm endangering the mission. I shouldn't have come. I have no memory of my mother. I never knew her. Then my father is truly dead. Soon I'll be dead. And you with me. He was certain that Vader was still a good guy. There is still good in him. There is good in him. I felt it. And nearly killed him in a fit of hateful rage. Luke isn't always who we want him to be, and that's why he works as a protagonist. Some fans wanted his challenges to be over. They wanted, if you can believe it, fan service. To see the characters exactly as we saw them before, doing what we saw before, just, you know, older. That didn't exactly work out for Indiana Jones. Reunions are inherently disappointing, aren't they? I mean, your old TV show, they go, oh boy, they're coming back after 20 years, and then you see, mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> and it goes against the mythology the series is based on. And what all the myths have to deal with is transformation of consciousness. That uh, you're thinking in this way, and you have now to think in that way. And if you look at, at the beginning of the hero's journey, like with King Arthur, he pulls a sword from the stone, he's ascendant, and if it then goes f past that and deals with the hero's life as they get into middle age and beyond, yeah. it gets into darker places. It gets dark, man. There's a reason for that. It's yeah. because myths are not made to sell action figures. Myths are made to reflect the most difficult transitions we go through in life. Yeah. Maybe the biggest strength of the serial format is seeing how history unfolds and how the characters evolve into different roles over time. It's not disrespectful to a character to deny them a happy ending. It's disrespectful to parade them around for nostalgia's sake without moving them forward. Part of the reason the characters never had that happy reunion is that Harrison Ford didn't want to be an empty cameo. Harrison has always said that he knew that Han needed to have clear utility. In this case, there was such clear utility. Han's death in The Force Awakens was totally in the service of that film's plot. It wasn't about Han, it was about the new characters. Thirty years ago, no one would have predicted that his story would end this way, because these elements weren't even on the table back then. You said poisonous gas. Fix that. Can you unfix it? Even when Han was introduced in The Force Awakens, you would never have seen it coming. Luke, on the other hand, has an ending that not only serves this story, but his character as a whole. After beginning a new Jedi temple, he began to lose Ben to the dark side. Based on what Leia says, There's too much Vader in him. That's why I wanted him to train with Luke. Luke must have known the danger from the beginning and would have been trying everything he could to prevent it up until that point. 
and it was beyond what I ever imagined. With all else failed, Luke is faced with the choice of killing him to prevent history from repeating, and this is where I think the film lost people forever. People say this scene destroys Luke's character because he was always trying to save his friends, but that's exactly what this moment is about. He would bring destruction and pain and death at the end of everything I love because of what he will become. Had he gone through with it, he could have saved his Jedi and everyone else Kylo Ren killed. But Luke didn't go through with it, because it's not in his character. It passed like a fleeting shadow, and I was left with shame. Once again, he falters before ultimately doing the right thing. Losing his students finally awakens him to the truth, that the Jedi were failures. If you strip away the myth and look at their deeds, the legacy of the Jedi is failure. At the height of their powers, they allowed Darth Sidious to rise, create the Empire, and wipe them out. Luke believed wholeheartedly in an idealized version of them based on a few mere sentences from Obi-Wan and Yoda. He assumed that restoring their order would make things right again. Joseph Campbell wrote that the hero's conflict can't be solved by a return to the good old days, that the rebirth of the old thing will only serve to perpetuate the cycle. Luke and Leia both tried to resurrect the old thing and it went badly right away this time. Luke has failed before, but this time it's not just him paying the price. The entire galaxy is suffering the result of his actions. He comes to see that maybe getting all these light side users together invites the dark side to destroy them, that the Jedi Order was a fatally flawed idea. Letting it die out will cause the Force to find a new way that may succeed where the Jedi failed. To say that if the Jedi die, the light dies is vanity. Can you feel that? Luke knows his allies won't accept his decision, which is why he leaves them. He's not giving up on them. He's helping them the only way he thinks he can. It's a callback to his failure in Empire Strikes Back, showing that Luke now has the maturity to do the difficult thing and not act on impulse. The new trilogy seems to be heading towards the idea that there needs to be a more permanent solution to the conflict, and this is why I don't agree with the people who say that the new films ruined the Return of the Jedi's happy ending. Luke's Jedi Order was always doomed to be undone by the cycle of light and dark repeating again, and that's exactly what Luke is trying to stop. And this is where themes become incredibly important to the story. Star Wars has always had a lot of general themes. It's all about generations, and it's about the issues of fathers and sons and grandfathers. But The Last Jedi gets far more specific and says more than any other movie in the series. The first theme is the idea of destruction versus preservation. Obviously, old ideas can't work forever and have to be abandoned at some point, but clear burning everything will result in good things being lost. It's why Kylo Ren is the villain. The Sith, the Jedi, the Rebels, let it all die. There has to be a balance between old and new, and finding that balance is where the conflict lies. Luke's insistence that the Jedi be lost to history has aligned him with the bad guys in this regard. I did not expect Skywalker to be so wise. The decision to preserve or destroy even plays out in a literal sense with Poe's opening attack. I'm with the droid on this one. Leia is focused on preserving the fleet and simply wants to escape once the last ship is ready. Poe disregards her orders and deploys bombers to finish his attack on the dreadnought. The attack goes horribly wrong and puts the entire fleet at risk, forcing Rose's sister to sacrifice herself to save the resistance. Poe believes it's a victory because they blew up the thing but Leia regards it as a failure because of the people they lost. And over the course of the film, it's clear that Leia is right. The Resistance doesn't even have a fleet for that ship to be a threat to by the end. Those people and resources were far more valuable than this empty victory. Leia depends on Poe to take over for her, but he only understands leadership from the perspective of an X-Wing pilot. Like Luke with the Jedi, he's filled with misconceptions about what the role he's growing into is. So Ryan Johnson takes away his X-Wing and forces him to learn the hard way. To him, leadership is all about bravado and heroics, but his choices end up necessitating that others heroically sacrifice themselves. And while their actions work, it's a leader's job to prevent things from coming to that. There were heroes on that mission. Dead heroes. He comes to realize that protecting the Resistance is a far greater responsibility than blowing things up, and completes his arc by recognizing that the cannon attack is a futile gesture. The point is stated with absolutely no subtlety when Rose saves Finn from sacrificing himself. That's how we're gonna win. Fighting what we hate. Saving what we love. But the film has earned that corny line by hammering this point in from the very first minute. Blowing up that cannon would have just delayed the inevitable. Their only goal was getting out alive, which Finn does thanks to Rose. Like it or not, she was right. Finn's arc shows the importance of heroes and legends. We know from The Force Awakens that he's not a hero, but a guy who did the right thing at the right time against every fiber of his being telling him otherwise. All he wanted to do was disappear. He was never joining the Resistance and only stuck around in the last film to rescue Rey. 
I'm just here to get Ray. Regardless, he becomes a hero overnight. Rose's character demonstrates the important effect his actions have had. When we heard about it, my sister Paige said, Rose, that's a real hero. She's deflated when finding out that he's actually a deserter. But over the course of the story, Finn is pressured to live up to the myth. DJ tests his commitment to playing hero with a muddied view of right and wrong that may appeal to his desire to flee. It's all a machine, partner. Live free. Don't join. But he overcomes his uncertainty and recognizes that this is where he belongs. By the end, he is the hero Rose originally thought him to be. And Rose is inspired to grow from a meek technician into a hero herself. This is the value that a hero myth can have, even if it isn't really true. All of the mythology that Star Wars is based on is fiction. It exists across every culture because of our psychological need for it. Ryan Johnson is saying that it's okay if the hero doesn't measure up to the myth, because it's not about that individual. It's about the larger idea that they provide the spark for. Luke is the biggest hero in the galaxy, to the point that people think everything would be solved if he just returned. Because of you, now we have a chance. That droid has a map that leads straight to Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker. Luke. They believe in the myth version of Luke, the one that fans wanted. The infallible hero who doesn't exist. A Gary Stu, if you will. King Arthur has always been a major influence on Star Wars, but it's especially clear in the new movies. Rey offers Luke his Excalibur and the chance to return as the hero, and Luke bitterly rejects it. Which is kind of out of character. Luke would never throw away his lightsaber like it were garb- oh. You think that I came to the most unfindable place in the galaxy for no reason at all? That saber is a symbol of everything that went wrong in his life. He resents it and the myths surrounding him. But it puts Luke in the painful position of knowing that everyone's last hope is resting with him and there's nothing he can do for them. His resolve to stay disconnected and end the Jedi begins to crack. He's reminded of the good he was able to do while inspired by the Jedi myth. And the bad that happened when he wasn't there. Rey wears him down to the point that he not only begins teaching her but opens himself back up to the Force. And just as he's ready to return with her, history repeats. Rey, don't do this. You must not go. Believing he's lost her and only made things worse again, he recommits to torching the last remnants of the Jedi when Yoda finally sets him straight on the last theme. Failure. Yes, failure, most of all. The greatest teacher failure is. The series is full of that's just crazy enough to work plans, and this may be the first time it actually doesn't work. Failures are an inevitable part of life, and they don't always happen for poetic reasons. Like Luke, the good guys tried to help and only made things worse. But failure is not a license to withdraw and stop trying. Still looking to the horizon. Never hear. Ah. Hmm? The need in front of your nose. Luke still has an obligation to pass on what he knows and to fulfill the need the universe has of him. I can't be what she needs me to be. He realizes that the answer is to be who she needs him to be. And so he does what he said he couldn't. I'm gonna walk out with a laser sword and face down the whole first Because that's what the Luke they believe in would do. He's using his old lightsaber, the hero's sword that he's been refusing, because now he accepts that role again. It's also the sword that rejected Kylo Ren. That lightsaber... It belongs to me. It doesn't, and Luke is rubbing his face in it. He even presents himself exactly as Kylo Ren last saw him. All that Ben has wanted to do from the start is kill Luke just like Vader killed Obi-Wan. I want that map. You bring Luke Skywalker to me. Luke knows his anger is his biggest weakness and exploits it. Not just to buy time, but as a final lesson. For the second film in a row, Kylo is left knowing that this path has ruined him. Luke is saving the Resistance on a literal level, but he's also tying all of the themes together. He understands that erasing the history of the Jedi won't serve future generations that the lessons of their failures will only help Rey forge that new path. He's accepted that his hero myth is more important to the galaxy than anything else he can give. That it doesn't really matter if he is that hero or not. It's been shown that using the Force can be draining. I can't. You're not doing this. The effort would kill you. Luke knows he won't survive this, but that his legend will. When the Resistance fails and the spark of hope dies, Luke becomes the spark. The moral objective is that of saving a people, or saving a person, or saving an idea. He is sacrificing himself for something. That's the morality of it.
At the end of the film, we can see the impact of Luke's decision. Not long after the battle, the kids are reenacting what happened on Crate. He's given a new generation hope. And because Star Wars fans fall over themselves to willfully misinterpret everything in the most literal way possible, people thought this was about setting up a Broom Boy trilogy. New hints about Ryan Johnson's Broom Boy saga. Has Disney canceled Broom Boy? Ten reasons the Broom Boy trilogy is going to fail. Most YouTubers I've seen ignore the mythology and totally miss the point as a result. Yeah, it, there was a lot of weird shit going on. It was bizarre. This didn't seem like a singular vision. This seemed like it, it, the, the, the vision of producers who were making a property for money because they acquired it. So it's the weird idea of an eccentric filmmaker and a corporate committee project. The soulless corporate decision would have been to do easy fan service, not all of this weird shit. Poe Dameron, he's the only character in this movie with an arc. Mr. Plinkett, the internet's foremost critic of the prequels, spent the first half of his review struggling to invent plot holes. So you say to yourself, I guess it doesn't really matter how the First Order found the rebel base, right? But you know, it adds something. That was in the last movie. We have their location. We tracked their reconnaissance ship to the Elenium system. Why are they even bothering chasing down an elderly lady and all of her friends? The fuck are they gonna do? They did just blow up their incredibly important weapon. You might remember it as a little thing called the, the climax, climax of the, of the fucking, fucking film. film. But this is the important part. That should have been the last time we saw Luke. And here's how the film should have ended. Join me. You probably noticed that Titanic didn't end after hitting the iceberg, and Seven Samurai didn't end when the bandits arrived at the village. Because ending the movie before resolving the threads you just spent two hours building up is a terrible idea. Someone could only suggest this if they didn't even know those threads are there. Who the fuck knows what's going on? People only seem to think about the film in terms of how much they hate it. They'll make fun of Leia flying through space or point out an extra in the background that isn't doing what they should be. You can needle the originals in this way too. I don't really care if this is on someone's list of forbidden Last Jedi defenses, it's true. An entire legion of my best troops awaits them. Rogue One seems to be more what most people meant when they said they wanted movies like the originals again. Movies that remind us of the originals, that look like the originals, but not movies that are actually written like them. We've got Star Wars exactly where we want it. Don't fuck with it. Show us the stuff we've seen before, doing the stuff we've seen before, and no one gets hurt. I'm being a hypocrite about this since I nitpick things all the time. It's what YouTube is for. But when I dislike something, I make a genuine effort to understand why it turned out that way. Is there some kind of appeal I'm missing? Am I seeing it from all sides? Practically nothing is completely bad and devoid of value. Considerations like this separate good criticism from bad. But how am I to know the good side from the bad? You will know when you are calm at peace. I didn't really like The Last Jedi when leaving the theater. It's like the second and third act of a trilogy wedged together. And with Disney rushing the films out in just two years, it's inevitable that a movie this ambitious will turn out uneven. I don't think anyone finds the Canto Bite stuff as interesting as Luke and Rey's story. I thought the movie was funny, but they may have gone too far in a few places. There are a few details I wish I could change, like Rose smashing into Finn with enough force to kill them both. But I didn't rush to judge it. The more I thought about it, the richer I realized the storytelling was, and the faults started to seem comparatively petty. And when listening to Ryan Johnson talk about it, everything I was thinking lined up perfectly. He's realized that if he brings the Jedi back into this, then the Sith are going to rise up again, and the whole thing is going to start again, and it's just going to be more, more misery. If you are one of the people who hates this movie, nothing I've said has changed your mind. And that's fine. I understand a lot of the complaints and even share a few of them. I get that not everyone is as forgiving as I am. But if you take anything from this, it's to take it down a notch. The backlash is originating from a place of love for the series, but I don't think fans realize how vicious and hateful it gets when it all pulls together. They've crafted an alternate universe where The Last Jedi wasn't a critical and commercial success, where Ryan Johnson hasn't continued to have a great career, and where everyone hates the film as much as they do. In that echo chamber, Mark Hamill supposedly hates the movie and Ryan Johnson over his initial disagreement on Luke. They don't mention this part. Having seen the movie, I was wrong. He's always right. He's always right. But he was always right. I'm firmly in Ryan's camp now. He even called it an all-time great film. It doesn't sound like that narrative pans out. It's often said that the sequel trilogy had no plan and that Ryan Johnson ruined everything J.J. Abrams set up. But there was an arc set for the trilogy. And J.J. said he loved Ryan's script so much he was jealous he didn't make it himself. That the film didn't disrupt the ending he planned and that he was inspired by The Last Jedi to be bolder with his final film. 
I've seen claims that it only has good reviews because Disney bribed everyone, when in reality it's the audience reviews that are dubious because of the review bombing campaigns against the film. The absolute rock bottom of the fanbase targeted Kelly Marie Tran with racist and sexist harassment until she abandoned Instagram. Someone's responding to diversity negatively. Fuck them, you know? <laughs> Daisy Ridley left social media altogether. Jar Jar's actor Ahmed Bess contemplated suicide after the backlash to his character. George Lucas posed the question, why would I want to make any more films when everyone yells at me that I'm a terrible person all the time? And, yeah. Why would anyone put themselves in the crosshairs of this fanbase? Just search Ryan Johnson's name and you'll see a never-ending stream of vitriol with his every utterance twisted into a new way of attacking him. And in spite of that, he's supernaturally unfazed and positive about the fans, the ones that aren't racist. I mean, it was the, it was the happiest experience of my life, you know? Everything, the, the release of it, the interactions with all the fans, all of it. You know, people, when people care this deeply about something, that's what happens, and that's what makes it wonderful. And I, I feel very incredibly privileged to have just been a part of it, you know? I say all of this not to vilify anyone, well, them, obviously, but to salvage whatever hope there is for you to enjoy this trilogy. The finale is coming, and who knows? Maybe it will retcon things and blow holes in my arguments. Maybe it'll be great, maybe it'll disappoint. Regardless of how it turns out, this is your last chance at this. Instead of bringing all of the baggage and hostility with, Let's go see Rise of Skywalker! Try to think about how audiences felt seeing the birth of the series back in 1977. Relax your stranglehold and let the filmmaker have Star Wars for a few hours. Forget about your demands and rule books and go on the journey that they want to take you on. And if you give it that chance and still don't like it, by all means, criticize it. But do it fairly, with the knowledge that it was made by human beings who worked themselves half to death to give you the best story they could. Don't give in to hate. Mind what you have learned. Save you again. I will. I promise. And with that, I have ruined my channel. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I'll be in the garbage if anyone needs me. Stick to video games, asshole! It's the double feminazi You don't know shit about Star Wars. You got the timeline all wrong. You never even read the extended universe. You don't know shit. Boo!